Hello, everybody, and welcome to another very special detailed diatribe. Uh, it's I don't know why I said very special. This is pretty much on brand for the other detailed diatribes we've done so far. It's not like a special holiday event or whatever, but I'm excited about this because... It, me medium special at best, but still very exciting. Moderately <laughs> special, you know, in the grand calculus of the multiverse, <laughs> there's only so there, special that this can Somewhere, be. Red and Blue are sitting down to record a detailed diatribe that is the most special detailed diatribe ever. Ah, uh, just the most but special. But we're not, we're not in that multiverse. So no, that's, that's we're in this shame. timeline instead. Uh, in case yeah. you didn't pick up what we're putting down, the subject of uh, today's detailed diatribe is uh, is something that I've been mulling over for, for a while now, uh, and I like to call it the multiverse problem. And uh, to explain what exactly the multiverse problem is, I've prepared a handy dandy, super efficient uh, 40 slide slideshow. Uh, yes, yes! <laughs> <laughs> to discuss what exactly is going on. So uh, to start with, we must define the parameters that we're gonna be operating on. What is a multiverse. Now, obviously, in this specific context, we are discussing fictional multiverses, not real multiverse theory, none of that stuff. Not, not particularly interesting to me. But in fiction, the concept of a multiverse is essentially a setting that contains multiple universes or timelines, and the setting that the protagonists, the main characters, are from is typically just one universe out of many. A story will often introduce the concept of a multiverse in the context of a plotline that threatens the integrity of this home universe, like a bad future timeline, or a threat that's moving across dimensions, or an evil alternate version of themselves intruding, stuff like that. It's a very, very broad concept that covers a lot of ground. Uh, a lot of that ground is just fine. Some of that ground is very, very bad. Uh, so let's talk about it. Uh, this is exciting because I have passing familiarity with some multiverse stories in, you know, like kids media, like evil Danny Phantom and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, yeah, that's but in my list. <laughs> I, aside from a, a couple, you know, instances of, of Marvel coming into the phase four game with, mm. with multiversal nonsense, I am largely an outsider on this topic and I have some thoughts, but only some, and I don't know how strong they are. So we'll, we'll see how that develops as we go through the slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for your input because there are a few examples in here that I know you've got thoughts on. Uh, but yes. to start off, a little bit more categorization, there are, broadly speaking, two different kinds of multiverses. There are many world multiverses and there are branching timeline multiverses. Many worlds multiverses, that's how you cover things like magical other world stories, uh, Narnia, Oz, you know, stuff like that. The characters travel from their world to another world. You know, it's, it's essentially just a multiversal flavor on like the old sword and planet fantasy where people would be, or, or like Star Trek, where you've got a bunch of different inhabited planets and they're all very different, but like the people from them can come and hang out. Yeah, I, I believe Shakespeare's word for that was isekai. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the bard himself, <laughs> as we all know. <laughs> So, uh, so that type of multiverse, that doesn't tend to be where the problems lie. The branching timeline multiverse is a different format for these stories, where instead there's this sort of concept that these are alternate versions of our universe. So there might be alternate versions of familiar characters. It's like, if you go from Earth to Oz, you're not going to find an Oz version of yourself. But like, in my example on this slide is Into the Spider-Verse, where like, all of those universes are extremely different, but they are on some level all different versions of the same universe. There are often going to be stories that have this sort of vague ambiguity between like, is this like a branching timeline alternate, like somebody made a different choice and now you live in Toontown? Or like, are these worlds with different fundamental physical laws, but also there are different versions of the same guy across all these universes for some reason. Just imagining like uh, Edison didn't get the patent for the motion picture and then therefore 150 years later we live in Toontown. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> obviously that's the only logical explanation for how Spider Pig happened. Yeah. So these universes will either strongly or superficially resemble each other. You know, th this is where you start getting things like the time plot, where it's like, oh, I'm you from like an alternate universe or from an alternate future or whatever. Those ones tend to be a little bit more fast and loose, and the branching timeline multiverse is where the problems begin. Now, multiverses disrupt the story that they're introduced into to varying degrees, because of course, the basic premise of a multiverse of, hey, there's multiple universes, yours is just one of them, is usually accompanied by the concept, and your universe is under threat, and that is the disruption. Uh, so essentially, the introduction of the multiverse can
can either disrupt the story a little bit, or it can disrupt the story a whole bunch. Low disruption stories are like the standard uh, multiverse travel isekai things. The character travels from one world to another, but the consequences of their actions tend to be limited to whatever world they're in at the time. It's more of a personal journey thing, and it affects how the character comes back rather than mm -hmm. yeah. anything, yeah, tangible world level stuff. Yeah, yeah it serves a, in the hero's journey, you know, cycle uh, as this is what happens after you cross the threshold, and then when you come back, the world is unchanged behind you. There might be sort of a large scale, general existential, oh, the, the multiverse is under threat. If we fix things in this world, though, th that won't be a problem. We'll be fine, actually, you know, Spider-Verse style. This tends to be pretty much fine. This doesn't really disrupt the audience's ability to get invested. It's just like, oh, there's a looming threat, and we have some fun new characters to play with for this arc. Medium disruption is when you have multiverse stories where, like, alternate timelines and futures are visited, but they're usually treated as, like, sort of compartmentalized object lessons. Like, oh, you go to the bad future where someone died or someone turned evil and, like, the world is being dominated by, like, an evil emperor who might be your best friend. And that's bad, but, like, the general goal for the heroes is get back to the past and prevent that from happening. So the idea is, like, this isn't going to disrupt the main timeline. They're not going to go back farther and mess up their own history. They're just going to go back to, like, their original timeline, beat the bad guy, and then everything will be sunshine and roses from then on. So a lot of time plots tend to follow this format. Evil characters from the future usually show up in this version. There might be a bit of a scare where it's like, oh no, they're winning, the dark future is assured, but then they'll they'll lose in the end, it'll be great. Your uh, Danny Phantom example was very serendipitous because that's exactly what this is. <laughs> One brain cell. <laughs> One brain cell. <laughs> um, then you start getting into high disruption multiverse stories, which is where there are shenanigans that are typically, but not always of the time variety, that alter the hero's home timeline dramatically. Usually these alterations are fixed, but often there are little bits left over that are sort of still changed. So like, if a bad guy goes back in time and takes over the world in like the mid 1900s, just to pull an example out of absolutely nowhere, and then in the present, the heroes are dealing with some weird changed alternate reality where everything sucks, and then they have to go back and fix that. That's technically high disruption, but it does usually get mostly repaired. Although sometimes like characters, like relationships will be slightly changed. Somebody might have died in the past or like something like that can happen. Uh, this is a little bit of a danger zone because well, we'll get to it, but basically, if you introduce anything that retcons things that the characters and the audience have already gotten invested in, you're you're, you're flirting with danger. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's when we reach the maximum level of disruption, which is where characters' multiversal travel or alterations to the timeline are permanent. Whatever they do irrevocably changes their universe or their timeline. Maybe the characters leave their universe of origin and they never return, or that universe is permanently changed. There's basically no concept of a true timeline in this setting. Uh, continuity is completely flexible by multiverse fuckery. There are many examples of this. Uh, we will discuss all of the ones I have listed later in the slideshow, but uh, basically this is where I believe the multiverse problem begins to rear its ugly head. And it is why when you have an established story where there's one main universe, one timeline that we've been following, and then the writer introduces a multiverse into the mix, that can be a harbinger of doom. Now, the thing is, when a writer wants to shake up the status quo in a big way. A multiverse can be a fun way to do it. You know, you bring in new characters, you bring in a threat, not just to the world, but to the very fabric of reality. It, it's a reasonable escalation of stakes from the standard save the world plotline. But there are other reasons a writer might want to introduce a multiverse, and oftentimes when the concept is introduced, it signals that the main universe that we've been following is about to get rewritten, overwritten, or otherwise fundamentally changed, because there is no easier way to do that narratively speaking, than introducing there are many worlds, many universes, many timelines, things can happen that change everything fundamentally from the ground up and it's totally fine. This basically means that the canon that we the audience have gotten invested in can very suddenly and thoroughly be changed with very little justification other than there's a multiverse now. All kinds of crazy stuff can happen in the multiverse. <laughs> and a lot of writers like doing this when they uh, don't want to yes and their own continuity anymore and they want to start retconning things because that'll make things easier for them. There is a certain point of, of writing long form media where you find that you've either written yourself into a corner mm -hmm. or you choose to 
to write that there that that wasn't actually a corner that was an open doorway to a, a whole bunch of other stuff and <laughs> yeah that's I, I think there's a reason that this problem gets highlighted in the realm of comic books and other hyper serialized decades long approaching century long continuities <laughs> oh God, that keep building and building thought. and building yeah and eventually some author somewhere is like ah eh, shit wait a second <laughs> no yeah exactly uh essentially when you really want to basically excise a part of the canon that you don't want to deal with anymore, especially if you are working on a long-form project that a ton of other people have been building up, like for example comic books, there's very easy ways to internally justify doing that. The problem is, when you use a multiverse for this, it creates a canonical in-universe mechanism to retcon the plot. Once that concept is introduced into the setting, it can't be unintroduced. You know, you, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. The writer, <laughs> and every writer that comes after them, now has has permanent access to a reset button, and the audience therefore knows that nothing in canon is set in stone anymore. Yeah, once you introduce what's essentially Chekhov's Gatling gun of <laughs> retcons, there's no way to undo that. Uh huh. Yeah, so basically when you introduce a multiverse specifically for the purpose of completely changing the main timeline without having to actually go back and do the heavy lifting of telling that story, you're just like, oh, things are changed, uh, now that thing that happened in the 70s, it's different, uh, we don't need to worry about it anymore. Now the audience basically knows is that you can just reach back in the plot, in the timeline, into wherever, and say, this is different now because of multiverse stuff. And in this context, basically, multiverse is being used as like, because I said so. <laughs> but <laughs> once the multiverse is introduced, it can be very easily used this way. And the biggest problem is one that I think a lot of writers don't actually think about, because when you are the writer, your concept of the world and the story you're telling is already extremely flexible, because you are constantly considering possibilities and angles and things that you might introduce or that you might not do, or you, you aim to do one thing, but then the way it comes out on the paper, it's different. That's just a, a fact of how writing works. But for the audience, the plot is rigid, unchanging. It is set down, and then those are the axioms that they operate in when they are fans of this work. So I think for a writer, it can be easier mentally to be like, it's actually fine if I go back and tweak this thing, because I was already thinking of doing it that way anyway, so it wouldn't be that different. But for an audience, that's like shaking the very foundations of this world you've created, where, where a writer's perspective perspective on their world is by definition creatively fluid, the audience's perspective tends to be a little bit more like this is a foundational structure. It's it's solid. And when the audience sees the writer essentially reach back and be like, just kidding, this is different now, it shakes their investment. A writer cannot predict what specific parts of the story the audience will be very strongly invested in. In a typical story without multiverse fuckery, there are tons of things an audience can get invested in. They can like the heroes, the villains, the supporting characters, the romantic subplots with the supporting characters, just the background characters sometimes. They might really like the setting, the world building, the magic system, the weird little quirks of, oh, I introduced this one fun character who hints at a much broader universe behind them. That's pretty cool. They might like that guy. But if you're the writer, you can't predict what parts of the story are going to completely resonate with your audience. And when you go back and you change things, it's entirely possible that you're going to rip the tablecloth out from under a part of the story that your audience really, really liked. Yeah, it's, it's like a ship of Theseus kind of thing where every single audience member has a different plank that they're like this one <laughs> is essential to the identity of this being Theseus's ship. If you change this one plank, it's no longer his where someone else is like, as long as you don't change the sails, like I don't really give a, I don't give a damn man, it's, it's fine. And the writer has no way to know what that is. And essentially the only safe assumption is that you can't touch any of them, but then you're once again kind of stuck in a corner. So yeah. well, it, it becomes dodgy. It's interesting because the ship of Theseus is a very good analogy for this specific approach, but in general, most of the way that people build stories is more like very slowly adding to like a very large Lego build. Like, yeah. instead of going back and tweaking things, you're adding more pieces onto it. And that isn't so much a problem, because the parts of the build that your audience likes are still gonna be there. Like, they might get built up around, or something might even get built in front of them so they can't even see it anymore, but it's still in the foundations. When you introduce the concept of multiversal canonical retcons, you basically allow yourself to reach back and just pull out chunks of the old build, and then you start getting the, the Ship of Theseus problem. And you can't know which parts of your sprawling build the audience really likes. But if you're the writer, if you're the creator, this whole thing is yours to play with. It doesn't feel like in your head it should matter that you're changing these things, but it does. It does matter. Now the thing is, if your 
multiverse disrupts like a secondary world. Like, oh, we introduced this other universe and then the universe got like eaten by Galactus. Oh no. It's like, oh, that's a shame, I guess. But like, we didn't really have time to get invested in it. But if the introduction of your multiverse disrupts the quote unquote main world, the one that we are already invested in, that investment slips because anything can be changed. Perhaps something fundamental has already been changed. So the audience's space of investment shrinks from the world, the setting, the secondary characters, the general cosmic threats to just the characters that aren't changed. This is like a an aspect of the problem I have with time skips, where if you take the characters and then you like jump ahead like five years and then they're like, oh, it's still the same guys, but they've been doing a lot of stuff that you haven't seen yet. If your audience has been like invested in those characters, following them along on their journey, and suddenly there's like a five year gap where they have no idea what happened and who they are, they have to get reinvested. And sometimes they don't always get reinvested. A lot of shows that do time skips will see an audience drop off after that just because you're gonna shake loose some people who are like, I liked what you were doing before, but I don't like what you're doing now, so meh. Or I like this version of the character, but jumping to some future point in time, enough has changed suddenly that there's no longer that continuity anymore. Whereas like, if we were to follow this in, you know, quote unquote, real time, mm. I'd see like, oh, okay, you know, here we are, I get where we're going. But to suddenly be like, ah, oh, this is a new thing now, is enough of a shock that some people might just be like, eh. Yeah, that eh is, it's, it's what you absolutely do not want to happen as a writer. So when you do multiverse time travel fuckery, when you change the main universe out from under them, and it's like, this is how it's gonna be from now on. The space that your audience feels safe getting invested in shrinks drastically. And even worse, the audience knows you can do it again at any time. You've set a precedent for a way to completely change the universe out from under them, and now they have no reason to trust anything you do in the future. You can give them, oh, look, I'm, re I'm resolving this romantic subplot, isn't that great? Oh, look, this character was evil, but now they're good. And the audience is like, I've already seen you give me this and rip it away from me before. <laughs> <laughs> I have no reason to care that this happened because I don't know it's going to be permanent. But sometimes the impermanence is the entire point, whether or not that actually works out. So let's talk about Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> <laughs> this is great because I've been getting a little bit of this like second hand from you over the course of the past few weeks. Oh my god. I'm I'm fascinated to actually dig in and see what on earth this nonsense is. Oh, what, what on infinite, infinite earths Earth. this nonsense yeah. is. Oh god, <laughs> crisis on infinite earths. Okay, so the year is 1985. DC Comics is turning 50 years old. The Golden Age and the Silver Age have come and gone. The Dark Age looms on the horizon. It's been 50 years. Superhero comics have gotten very, very big. It started off pretty small, simple, niche, very silly. A lot of basically like, you know, selling war bonds. You'd slap a costume on a character and then send him off to punch old Hitler on the jaw and it would be great. But the universe has gotten a lot bigger. Crossover events and team-ups have become more and more of a thing. Tons and tons of writers have come and gone, each adding their own unique twist on characters. And when that happens, you begin to get contradictions in canon. You get contradictions in canon even in long-form stories written by one person. Long-form stories written by dozens, if not hundreds of people, you're gonna get things that don't make sense together. To sort of cover up some of these, spackle over them, the concept of a multiverse was originally introduced in the crossover comic The Flash of Two Worlds, where basically Barry Allen like runs a little bit too fast and accidentally vibrates into another universe where Jay Garrick, the original Flash, lives. This is to resolve one very simple problem, which is that Barry Allen's origin story is that he was reading a comic book about Jay Garrick when he got his powers, but Jay Garrick was an existing DC superhero like they they existed in the same universe. So it didn't really make sense that he'd be a fictional character for Barry Allen, but a real character in his own run. And Flash of Two Worlds was basically like, okay, all the Golden Age heroes, they're basically still doing their thing, but they're like off in their own universe. And the heroes that we're familiar with now, they only see that universe through like comic books about it, which is, I guess, a solution. <laughs> it breaks a little bit on inspection because it's like, who's writing these? <laughs> but it it is clean enough that it's like fridge logic. It's like, okay, yeah. Okay, fine. I'll, 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 I'll let that happen. Take, you know, divine muse inspiration of some, you know, writer in, in fake DC comics inside of DC <laughs> comics that yeah. just like has the, it's like, you know, fine, fine. It, it's, it's workable. Yeah. <laughs> this was actually uh, played with in a Justice League episode, a two-parter, Legends, where some of the gang end up in basically an alternate, very colorful, very chipper universe starring uh, with a bunch of heroes that Green Lantern read about in comic books when he was a kid. And it turns out that this universe actually destroyed itself in nuclear war like 50 years ago and is being cool. <laughs> artificially maintained by the superpowers of 
this like telepathic supervillain. Anyway, it's a very direct overt reference to this. All the characters they meet are like extremely thinly veiled XBs of the original Justice Society, I want to say. Yeah. Very much before my time. But this concept of like you accidentally vibrated into another dimension and now you're running into like the original draft of your own characters. It was just a thing that DC introduced to have this fun little crossover happen. And then the concept of the multiverse sort of got expanded out. And the audience and the writers liked that a lot because if they had a fun idea, they could just put it in their own little universe. It didn't need to affect the main continuity. They could do the universe where everybody who was a hero in our universe was a bad guy and the only hero in the world was Lex Luthor. And that was Earth 3 and it was it was fun. It was how you, you could do all your good, clean, evil Superman stories without ever having to actually mess up real Superman. It's it's also kind of what they're doing with, with the modern slate of, of DC movies because we have, you know, kind of like Justice League continuity in some of the movies that are associated with that. Mm. But then we also have Joker movie continuity. Right. We have the, the Batman movie continuity. And DC would rather just make the fun concepts of cool movies than try to bend over backwards and justify all of it. So in this instance, they actually kind of play it straight by being like, look, this is just a different story. It's just a different Batman in a different world. This is Robert Pattinson's Batman. Like, here you go. Just, just let it exist on its own. Great. And everyone's like, cool. Got it. Yep. People can like the DC main timeline. People can watch Joker if they're into that. That's fine. Um, and people can enjoy the Batman movies completely independently, knowing it's all kind of the same characters, but very cleanly cordoning everything off into its own little timeline, not having to, you know, think too hard about it, just letting this iteration of a character exist and not trying to world build it in why there are all these different things. It's just different stories. Mm -hmm. And the Elseworlds concept had been kind of a thing before, but it, in this modern incarnation of DC film and television, mostly film, not so much TV, Arrowverse has yeah. a lot of weird stuff going on. <laughs> uh, but in film, it is actually a very elegant solution to wanting to do different versions of characters and different stories kind of concurrently. Yeah, no, definitely. In fact, there is a lot of benefit to be had by having that kind of freedom as a writer. The introduction of a multiverse can allow you to basically just explore a ton of Elseworld concepts without having to be like, and here's how this actually all works in the same universe. You don't need to do that. But it's 1985. DC has never dealt with this before, and they're getting a little bit sick of the multiverse. So in the in the intro to Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, Marv Wolfman, who's a very like acclaimed comic writer and has written a lot of very good stuff, he writes that the idea of consistency became more and more important as the DC universe grew and grew. Basically, they decided, you know what? This has gotten too complicated. This is just too much. So it's time for a crisis. So the official explanation has been that every inconsistency, canon, weirdness, all that stuff, one writer describes Atlantis one way, but then it shows up in a different way. That's all because they're happening in different Earths, infinite Earths you could say. But that's too many Earths. So now all the Earths are dying. <laughs> Every single one of them. Something really big is just wiping out Earths one after the other. First, they kill off that super villain Earth that I mentioned. They just get rid of everything there except for one clever thing, which is Lex Luthor and his wife, Lois Lane, save their infant son <laughs> by launching him out in a spaceship <laughs> into oh, another cute. universe, which is a clever little, hey, it's, it's cute. Yeah. So basically, the entire point of Crisis is we have too many Earths, we're going to end up with only one Earth. Unfortunately, we've just discussed that you can have a lot of good <laughs> stuff from having a lot of different Earths to play with. So we can already kind of tell that this is going to go bad, but you know. Th and we can also, given the fact that the DC movies happened after 1985, <laughs> clearly something <laughs> went, went wrong. Something changed. Something changed, yeah. So the, the universes get uh, whittled down. Heroes and villains get plucked from their different worlds by uh, the Monitor, who's sort of trying to get ahead of this and, and stop the destruction of the entire multiverse to at least try and save some universes. But essentially, from a meta perspective, these universes only exist to be wiped out en masse to leave only a single true timeline. Now, a lot of crazy shit happens in Crisis. It kind of has to. They're destroying, essentially, the entire DC continuity. Because the twist is that while it would be bad but acceptable if this left behind one universe untouched, that's not what happens. As the story progresses, the entire multiverse gets whittled down to only five universes that are all overlapping in a weird way. Also, they killed off some big name heroes, namely Supergirl and Barry Allen. They both got iced in big, dramatic, heroic sacrifices that people really didn't like if they liked these characters. Um, but this was part of the deal, you know? This was a crisis on infinite Earths. This is a big thing, you know? If you think it's not gonna matter, you're wrong. It's gonna matter like crazy. So, as mentioned, those sort of five partially fused universes end up getting uh, perfectly fused into one 
one Earth, the way that it was always intended to be, that there's only one universe, no weird fuckery, everything's totally fine, but what this means is that there are basically no universes left <laughs> that have been untouched. Even this, this universe that theoretically resembles the true continuity is different. So, the year is 1985, DC Comics is turning 50 years old, there is no longer a multiverse. To try and fix this, multiple copies of the same hero are now stuck in the same universe, characters whose origin stories no longer make sense still exist but are unmoored. There's a version of the Huntress whose origin is that she is the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. That didn't happen in this universe. So her parents' graves no longer exist, her apartment isn't hers anymore, she has no past, no backstory. This is discussed in story by the characters as a truly horrifying and existentially disturbing event. The survivors are disoriented, they're unmoored, they're grieving lives and loved ones that now never existed. Some of them have spouses in this world who know them, but don't remember their past together in the same way. Zoinks. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's fucking horrifying. This is in-universe framed as a deeply traumatic event that none of these characters enjoyed. But, you know, sacrifices have to be made for the single unified DC universe, and now that everything's all cleaned up, surely preserving continuity will be easy from here on out. I, I feel like I, I was just gonna <laughs> make the XKCD joke. <laughs> single brain cell. <laughs> um, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so obviously what ended up happening is that people who liked the parts of DC that were destroyed by this, which was <laughs> all of DC, were not happy with this turn of events, and the single unified universe they created was basically just one more universe on top of the pile. And it didn't even work <laughs> to keep the universes separate. <laughs> <laughs> because people like having a multiverse to play in, especially in something as nuts as a superhero universe where every writer has different ideas on what they want their characters to be able to do. So, what exactly did Crisis on Infinite Earths accomplish? Well... Can we go back real quick, though, because I love... <laughs> The second article on the right, DC now considers movies and TV shows to be part of the same multiverse, multiverse which is that there is a multi-multiverse of oh, DC media, Oh, you think that's so bad? stupid. If you examine the list of DC multiverse worlds on the left, you will see that there is in fact a multi-multiverse. <laughs> We have the original multiverse cataloged oh, and unclassified. No, there, is. there is. We've got the 52 multiverse, the multi multiverse, which includes the new 52 and DC Rebirth, as well as the multiverse 2 and the dark multiverse. <laughs> and then every wow. single animated series, TV show, and film and video game are in their own universe. And then there's a convergence of multiverses. I don't even know what that one is. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Crisis uh, didn't fix this, you could say. <laughs> um, now, what, what did it do? Well, you know, it, it, it's a big boy series. It, it had some serious consequences. It killed off beloved heroes like Supergirl and Barry Allen until the writers said no thank you and brought them back several times. Decanonized a whole bunch of major events and characters, wiped the slate clean until the writers said no thanks and brought them back several times. Provided an explanation for all future continuity wackiness that the writers could pull in future by basically just being like, it's a ripple effect from all the bullshit that happened in Crisis on Infinite Earths. One example of this is that I believe 10 years after the original Crisis, there was a another crisis that was sort of resolving some of the complicated consequences of crisis where let's see a whole bunch of the characters that didn't fit into the new universe ended up in a second secret like paradise dimension that was contained within Alexander Luther the son of Earth 3 Lex Luther and Lois Lane it's dumb but I think that basically those characters are like it's been 10 years we're getting out Superboy from the Earth Prime punches the universe really really hard the ripple effect from that is what brings Jason Todd back from the dead that that's the kind of shit we're dealing with right now. <laughs> That's how Jason Todd comes back? Yeah, Superboy Prime punched the universe really hard and the ripple effect made Jason Todd come back to life. <laughs> oh, wow. I, yeah. I, I guess I, I, I want to take a second to specify like what the weirdness is here because I think it might sound like we're um, talking about, you know, oh, multiverses are, are, are dumb. Mm. And I want to, I think I want to clarify that that's not no. what we're saying or what we're arguing, but rather multiverses are fine until the author gets very insecure about them mm. and tries to cover their tracks when they didn't need to. 
And yeah. then when you have like high impact maximum consequences multiverses, that's when you get the shenanigans uh, really starting to crop up. Like yeah. the question is not like, oh, why is, is Infinite Earth so terrible? It's why did they feel the need to do this? It's that's definitely part of it. But I will say that there is a, a problem fundamental to the introduction of the multiverse on its own, which is not to say that multiverse stories are always bad. There are ways to use them responsibly, but they are extremely powerful tools. And the fact that they facilitate canonical retcons makes them incredibly dangerous in the hands of a writer who isn't aware of what kind of impact they're going to have. The idea that Crisis on Infinite Earths could fix everything, could create one unified continuity that everybody would like and that all the writers would have an easy time writing in. In hindsight, it's clear that it was never going to work, but the idea there was we've created a huge mess. We've written ourselves into a corner. We want to fix this, but they didn't realize that the mess is what people liked about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other problem that this did is it introduced a precedent into specifically DC, but more broadly comics in general, which is that whenever the story was getting too complicated, they had an easy out, a precedented out, blow everything up and start over. <laughs> DC yeah. has reset its own timeline at least once every decade since Crisis, and it's been getting more frequent more recently. <laughs> they did Zero Hour in 1994, Infinite Crisis in 2006, Flashpoint and New 52 in 2011, DC Rebirth in 2016, they just announced a new one. It's oh got no. something to do with say, Watchmen. Well, it's, it's been six whole years since DC Rebirth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and every time it resets, it doesn't change the original universe. It basically just spawns off another new universe. <laughs> and the biggest problem is that it taught comic audiences that there was no point in getting invested for any length of time in the story because it could all change at any moment with no warning because some writer decided to scrap the whole thing or some other writer decided to scrap the entire setting it was happening in. And this is a precedent that comics have gleefully adhered to ever since, which is why most people who are into comic books now are into very specific runs or very specific writers who they trust to handle things correctly. They won't be into the entirety of the comics. I mean, the thing is, I don't think anybody was ever into all of DC Comics or all of Marvel Comics. They'd be into specific teams, specific characters. But now people will be like, I'm into this very specific version of Hawkeye or like, I like the Gail Simone run on Birds of Prey or stuff like that. Like they have to specify this one writer who I like and trust. I like what they did for about 20 issues of the comic before they moved on and somebody ruined everything. And of course, what it did not accomplish was making it so there was only one DC continuity. So good work, everybody. <laughs> Crisis on Infinite Earths is kind of the archetypical example in my head of the multiverse problem, which is that when you start playing around with what it means to have a multiverse, and when you start using it to change entire universes from the ground up, you are going to piss off so many people. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to work through a couple different ideas that are conflicting in my head. I'm getting a sense of like Streisand effect in the <laughs> multiverse is like, no one really is making a fuss about it until you make a fuss about the multiverse, and if DC was just just like, uh, okay. Yeah. And just like, let it slide. Maybe they could have, they could have found a, a quieter way to do it, but I, I can understand like, oh, let's make it a big event. Uh, and that'll be a fun thing. But by making it into such a gigantic transformative thing, they made it even flimsier. It's it's like the, the difference between all the save the world plot lines in the MCU movies and the more like kind of small scale, local town sized, city sized problems that tend to feel a lot more grounded because you can actually conceive of the scale of a city yep. rather than conceiving of the scale of a universe or a multiverse or the world being in peril, so yeah. uh, I don't know, there are a couple different thoughts swirling around, but it seems like such a loud way to, to try to fix a problem that might have been better served by either fixing it quietly or just like like inserting a little like Easter egg nod like, hey, look guys, here's kind of how this thing is, but... And of uh... course, the debatability of, you know, whether or not it even was necessary. Like, the writers certainly felt like it was annoying because they had to sift through all these different universes, there were all these continuity snarls, some of them had been explained away, some of them hadn't. Like, yeah, that's no fun, but... You know, people were working through solutions to that before that. One of the most, like, notorious continuity snarls in DC Comics is the entire history of Donna Troy, Wonder Girl, because her initial thing was that she was just, she was Wonder Woman when she was a teenager. Wonder Woman was like Wonder Tot, and then she was Wonder Girl, and then she was Wonder Woman. But some writer got confused and was like, oh, cool, there's like a teen sidekick for Wonder Woman running around. We can have her join the Teen Titans. So 
now there's a Wonder Girl running around in the same universe and timeline where Wonder Woman is running around and everyone's like, wait, hold on, what's going on? And they made this a plot in the, the new Teen Titans run where Dick Grayson basically goes and detective works his way through, okay, who is Donna Troy? Where did she come from? What is her actual past? And he found a solution. He like figured out who she was and then crisis happened. <laughs> and ruined it all over again. Like, there are other ways to fix continuity snarls than nobody look, we're gonna wreck everything and fix it and, and rebuild it better. It, it, it makes the audience so blatantly aware of the hand of the author. Mm -hmm. And you, you didn't mention it specifically, but you showed on screen earlier a little like three column spread from the beginning of Crisis on Infinite Earths, basically of the writers laying out, here's what we're gonna do. Yep. Look out, it's gonna be big and dramatic. And it's gonna be so this cool. ain't your grandmother's DC comics. People are gonna die. Die, and it's boy. gonna be insane. Yeah. It's 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 such a loud solution to the issue that calls so much attention to the fact that it is a story. Yeah. That even that alone, regardless of how well they actually wrote it, the fact that they framed it in such a way of like, look at this metatextual thing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. It automatically takes people a layer out because they're thinking too much of like, how does this affect the broader thing? And it's it's not thinking about the story, it's thinking about the process of writing the story, exactly. which is what a lot of the discourse around the Marvel movies have been lately is like, how are they gonna write this? Mm -hmm. As opposed to what are the characters gonna do? Yeah. It primes the audience to think one layer abstracted already, which for various strengths of MCU notwithstanding is very bad for audience investment. Yeah, Because no, people exactly. are primed to think about, here's how this is fucky and weird. Instead of like, oh, I like when the character punched the guy and then had emotions about a thing. That was cool. Yeah. It's, people aren't thinking about that stuff. They're thinking about continuity and multiverses and what the fuck Kang's gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting point that, you know, the thing I said briefly before, which is that, like, now people who are fans of comics are fans of, like, specific writers, that does mean that they have to be painstakingly aware the whole time that it is a, a work of art being created by a writer, and they might not get it right. And that's that's a level of mistrust that's being cultivated in the space of comic fans that's pretty disheartening to think about. And I, I had a, uh, a secondhand personal anecdote about Crisis on Infinite Earths I wanted to relate, because my dad is a classic comic fan, but Crisis on Infinite Earths is when he basically stopped reading. And he told me a specific anecdote for like what kind of made him go like, ah, okay, I see what's <laughs> happening here. Is that when Crisis was uh, running and it had started messing up the main universe and like, oh, it's happening in the 40th century too as well. He like sent in a letter that was like, um, what you're doing is completely messing up the, the Legion of Superheroes 31st century continuity. Like, I don't see how you're going to resolve this. And the response he got was basically, oh yeah, uh, we don't care about that. And he was like, <laughs> oh. All right, <laughs> so the biggest problem with Crisis is that essentially it was the writers laying down the law from on high. Here's the only parts of our world that you're allowed to care about. And if you liked anything else, you're gonna regret it. And that's just not a good way to cultivate a long-standing audience and how much they like your stuff. So, you know, that's that kind of sucks. <laughs> but there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from Crisis on Infinite Earths. Like, if you rip up your story by the roots, the audience and the writers are gonna know that that's a thing that you can do. And there will be no reason for them to get attached to anything. And if they do get attached, there's gonna be this undercurrent of like, oh man, I really hope you don't make me regret this. If you narrow the space of what actually matters in this story too far, you'll make the world feel claustrophobic and unimportant. The fact that Crisis on Infinite Earths started with like, we have an infinite multiverse of possibilities, but it's dead now. So uh, if you don't like this one, you're screwed. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. thanks. If the thing everybody likes about your story is how huge and sprawling and colorful and fun it is, hacking off 99% of that until there's only a tiny sliver of it left so it's easier for you to write is probably not going to win many people over. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's telling the Elseworlds flexibility is one of DC's current greatest strengths mm -hmm. in like visual TV and film media and being like, we're killing that. We're killing it dead. Yeah. And Flash <laughs> and Supergirl 2 yeah. <laughs> is, is such a, a bold play yeah. that only seems to be like, look, we're doing it because we can. That's that's what it screams to me is we're doing it because we can. Look at us. Look look at us yeah. with our with our big boy pencils. We're gonna we're gonna kill all these people. <laughs> and it's heartbreaking because like Marv Wolfman has handled a lot of really good writing really well. I don't think there was any malice or even incompetence in this. I just think nobody had ever done this level of canon retcon before. Nobody knew how cataclysmic it would be and, and what kind of precedent it would set going forward and how much it would harm the audience investment and make it impossible to build a consistent audience going forward because it essentially meant that these writers no longer needed to commit to the bit of their own established plot. On that note, if you choose a thin slice of your story to be the only thing that gets to stay on the arc and then everything else gets completely destroyed, you're tacitly telling the audience that only that 
thin slice ever mattered. Everything else that they cared about, they were stupid for caring about. And that's not a good thing to make your audience feel. Also, it doesn't actually count as preserving a consistent continuity if you just reboot the story from scratch every time it gets complicated and you don't want to do it anymore. Like, this is basically just like the shockingly huge and expensive version of that thing I've said before about how when you have a webcomic and the writer's like, wait, actually I have a better idea and they start the whole thing from scratch and then they burn out <laughs> within a week because like, yeah. it's not fun to retread old ground and you're not going to build a new audience by doing the same thing you were doing before but different. Anyway. Yeah, chapter one is a Michelangelo painting and chapter three is a stick drawing. <laughs> yeah, yep. And the stick drawing is usually more compelling. So, Crisis on Infinite Earths, how does this factor into the multiverse problem? Well, it was intended to remove the problem of having too many universes, so how could it be a multiverse problem if it did not in fact involve keeping a multiverse? Well, the thing is, like you've said, the option of Elseworlds and multiverses were extremely helpful. They gave writers leeway to play with wild concepts that would maybe be too disruptive in the main canon. They just had this huge sandbox to play with without needing to worry, in a sense, like the concern of, oh, the continuity, we keep messing up the continuity. Having a multiverse meant that that was much less of a concern. Having only one universe that absolutely must be preserved means that continuity is now an incredibly rigid concern. It's a terrifying level of restriction to write within. By reducing the DC universe to one true timeline that was not, in fact, any of the timelines that had previously existed that audiences had liked and gotten invested in, Crisis on Infinite Earths cut off all possibility of those fun Elseworlds stories, dramatically shrank the space of characters the audience could be invested in, and loosely decanonized all 50 years of their own lore. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could be trusted to be actually canonically true for very long because the entire universe had been shaken up and then they just kept doing it <laughs> every few years. And it punished fans who liked the parts of the canon that were sacrificed to create this quote-unquote true Earth. And this is just pretty much indicative of the fundamental problem where we find the multiverse problem, which is the question, which of these worlds actually matter from a storytelling standpoint? And in the danger zone are the stories where none of the worlds actually matter. And that's what happened in Crisis none of the worlds were preserved. The final version that was a fusion of five other worlds, it wasn't any of those worlds. It lost key pieces of them. Thus, none of the worlds actually mattered. In most stories where there's like, oh, this is a fun new universe, uh, characters are gonna visit for like one arc and then they're gonna leave, that's when basically only one universe really matters. The main one, where our heroes live. MCU sacred timeline exactly. kind of stuff. Exactly. <laughs> that's where you get stories where like, if you're visiting another timeline, like Marvel's What If, anything can happen in those universes. Things that would not ever happen in the mainline movies, like, you know, powerful characters going out like chumps, or a full-on zombie apocalypse <laughs> happening and destroying the entire world. Like, you wouldn't do that in the main universe after, you know, movies and movies of that, none of that happening. The plot armor requirements of the one universe where things matter are different than the sacrificial universes where anything can happen. Then there are stories where some universes matter, but maybe not all of them. And that's when you get things like Spider-Verse, where it's like they are trying to save all the universes, but also, like, we really only see glimpses of six of them and, like, the main one is kind of the important one, but, like, we care about getting the other spider people back to their universes because, you know, we want to help them out. We want their lives to go well. And even still, that's a that's a character motivation yep. rather than trying to get someone invested in the mechanical inner workings mm. of a multiverse itself. The, the, the touch point is not... We don't see anyone else's multiverse in anything other than a flashback, mm -hmm. but we get the other various Spider-Mans... <laughs> Spider to show up and we care about them because they're fun people yep. and we want them to, you know, succeed and be happy more so than we care specifically about what the noir Spider-Verse is actually, <laughs> like, specifically doing in that moment. Yeah. It is more common for some universes to matter in things that are, like, hero crossovers where you have a character from another universe propping into the universe of a different hero. We're probably only going to spend time in one of those universes for most of the story, but the audience is expected to know and like both of these characters and both of their universes and essentially the story is saying hey yeah we're watching this show but like that show is also in this multiverse and if you like that show you're gonna care about it you know you want this hero to get back there back to the plot all that cool stuff so that's mostly the context you find this in where the audience is already expected to be invested in both of these universes from their own stories and it's just fun to see their heroes hanging out and the rare case is when you have a multiverse where every single universe is treated as a complete whole world populated by real thinking and feeling people who matter this is extremely rare because stories really like having cannon fodder that they can just like spectacularly obliterate and be like, whoa, look at that, the threat's so scary. So that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. I don't know if you meant the pun, but like cannon fodder, eh. as in like for, for the pew pew, but also like narrative cannon. <laughs> 
Yeah, I get it. That's nice. Now, the nun zone is definitely where you find the multiverse problem, because when you have no universe or settings that explicitly matter enough to be preserved, the audience has nothing they can actually trust to get invested in. It's like trying to build foundations on sand. These stories will often lose a lot of their audience goodwill and attention the minute the hero's home universe is either abandoned or becomes fundamentally changed through, like, timeline fuckery. Because the audience no longer has a world that they are certain they can get invested in. Anything altered becomes unreliable going forward. The precedent set by the alteration means that nothing can really be trusted to stay the same. Character relations usually suffer from this the most frequently because they're the most dramatic thing you can erase via time travel slash universe hopping. So, like, characters who were, like, dating the timeline resets and now they never met and that's, you know, that's fun, I guess. Or, you know, this old friend is actually now your nemesis or this version of your ally doesn't know you and it's all the fun of a dramatic character arc without ever having to actually do any of the work <laughs> to set it up. This is, for me personally, the deal breaker that has knocked me out of liking several different shows, games, etc. And I have a few examples of those, uh, some of Let's which go. I think you'll know about. <clears throat> First of all, Bioshock Infinite. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who haven't played the game in a while, the first time we do some multiverse fuckery, uh, protagonist Booker DeWitt is tasked with finding a gunsmith to arm the Vox Populi Rebellion. When they find the guy, the guy's already dead. Fortunately, Booker DeWitt's fetch quest slash uh, escort quest, Elizabeth, has the ability to open portals to other dimensions whenever she wants, so she just opens a tear to an alternate universe where the gunsmith is still alive. Uh, and then they never go back. <laughs> It's like they forgot that they left their quest objective in the first universe and then they just keep going through other universes. Whoopsies. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of when the plot starts going up its own ass twice. So that's around the time where it's like, okay, I thought we were doing this, but actually we're doing something completely different. And I'm sure that was the point because we focused on it far too much for that to not be the overarching point of the story. But uh, when you give me a fetch quest and then you basically make it impossible for me to do it <laughs> because we never actually go back to the person who gave me the quest. It's like they're like, oh. It's a case of no take, only throw. Yeah. <laughs> in a different multiverse. <laughs> and it's also like, it, it, I guess it never occurs to Booker and Elizabeth that like the version of the Vox Populi Rebellion that gave them the quest is probably not going to be the same in this universe. So like they can't just go back to them and be like, hey, we got you those guns that your alternate universe copy wanted. Like, why would they think that? Anyway, this is also where it's like the characters are acting dumb enough that I can't relate to them because I can't trust them to act like human beings anymore. So that's fun. Bioshock is an interesting case where the plot has a minimum of two a maximum of about seven versions uh, <laughs> of all the important characters yep. that that ends up causing a little bit of trouble. And it's it's a great, fun little plot twist uh, the first time. And then if you go back, it's like, oh, no, this is actually not, yeah. not great. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I think there's a yeah. reason why the the thing from Bioshock Infinite that most people like the most is the like the DLC where it's Elizabeth in Rapture, you know? Yeah, because yeah, that one, yeah. they don't do any multiverse fuckery. It's just, hey, isn't it cool if we explore this one specific universe within the confines of this universe without introducing any Else multiverse worlds. fuckery? Elseworlds. 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 Yeah. Everybody loves a good Elseworld. Nobody likes it when they break the original canon. Speaking yeah. of, the second time I had, oh no, none of this actually matters, was in the CW Flash, tied in with the Arrowverse. Because of course, you know, oh, it's a, it's a it's a show about the Flash. This is great. He's gonna, he's gonna run real fast and punch some bad guys. The first time they introduce time travel undoing plot points is season one, episode 15. This is, is the, the season finale? Ali? No. Okay. But uh, this Never is mind. the best episode of the show. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, he has to time travel to save the city from a tidal wave. This undoes his first kiss with Iris, a major character death, and a reveal of a supervillain who's been in hiding, and basically everything else that happens in the episode. This is the one cool use for this kind of time travel fuckery because it essentially produces dramatic irony. The audience now has a ton yeah. of information the characters don't, and Barry was only, like, the only thing Barry knows got undone was the first kiss. Like, he, he wasn't there for the other stuff. So that's cool because now the audience has a bunch of information about like supervillain, what th what lengths that character's willing to go to if he's discovered that adds a, like a lot of tension to his whole deal. And then when one of the other characters starts getting flashes of memory of things that happened in this erased timeline, there's a lot of like, wait, what the fuck is happening? How does that guy know that? It, it, it didn't happen anymore. So that's the one cool use for this. Unfortunately, this is the precedent that they set that then becomes the entire rest of the show. <laughs> 
it's like every time they had a problem, it'd be like, I'm going to run five minutes back in time. And then they kept being like, oh, Barry, don't do that. You're going to break the universe. And then it's going to come back together slightly different. And you're going to regret it. And he's like, I'll do it anyway. And then it keeps going horribly wrong. I, yeah. I couldn't even find the specific episode that made me stop watching because when I went back looking for like, no, it's like they do time travel and it undoes like a relationship that I, that they were building up and they were like, oh, they finally got to this point. And then they, they like just broke the whole thing. And the show was like, ah, oh, we have seven examples of that in the first uh, two seasons alone. Which one are you thinking of? And it's like, I yeah. don't know. What I was, what I was thinking of was at the end of season one, they have this whole like flash, you know, and the bad guy thing that ends up with a time travel to kind of like time loop the instigating event of the season, mm -hmm. which is like, okay, <laughs> I, everything in your character so far this season has been leading you to not make this choice, but sure. And then the second season's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then the, the way that they resolve the conflict at the end of the second season is by more traveling back in time. They introduce the concept of ghost, like yep. time narc ghosts, <laughs> time ghosts who are like, you can't, you can't time travel. That's bad. Stephen and then they keep doing it anyway. Yeah, they just keep <laughs> doing it. So that, I just, I wasn't particularly interested in watching a show where every time the characters made any progress, Barry Allen could just be like, I have to get faster and then fuck it all up three episodes later so it never happened. I just didn't really want to watch that show. So I didn't. And on the subject of oh, yeah. I thought this show was going to be something else uh, but it's not. This was also my experience with Umbrella Academy, a show where uh. I I quite enjoyed the first season. Uh, I don't know if you've heard any of this. The uh, general gist is uh, I've seen the meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with the car. <laughs> with the, yeah, with the cars. Uh, basically, oh god, uh, basically, uh, this kid with time travel powers accidentally jumps into the future, past the point where the apocalypse happens, cannot figure out how to time travel back, gets picked up by a time travel agency of assassins, works for them for a while, then time travels back in time to try and prevent the apocalypse that he initially stumbled through by essentially meeting back up with his family, trying to save them. Instead, they argue for a whole week, and then the apocalypse happens anyway. So he jumps them back in time to like the 50s to try and fix it again, uh, maybe the 60s. Uh, and then they spend the whole week being a little bit less shitty to each other, you know, arguing less, uh, sort of getting to know each other a little bit better, being less terrible. Some of them made connections, a couple, like one of them's gotten married, uh, one of them's having like a, an extremely fraught relationship with this married woman. It's just a very complicated situation. And then they, they do prevent that apocalypse and then they come back to the future, the present that they left, like 2019. And the universe has completely changed and their own past hasn't happened anymore. And I decided I was not interested in watching season three. <laughs> Um, because yeah, that's fair. yeah well, because <laughs> at the end of every season, they basically completely reset everything that happened, and the only thing that you can possibly be invested in at that point is the main characters who are not changed by the universe alteration ripple effect, and they're such unlikable bastards. <laughs> they're all so <laughs> awful to each other that unless you really, really want to see them just like being terrible to each other for another season, then there's very little you can get invested in. And like every season, there was something important that got left behind. In, in the timeline change. Like one of the characters had a daughter that she didn't have custody of in the first season and she was trying to get that back. And then they travel back in time and then back to the future and her past never happened. That daughter doesn't exist anymore for sure. And in the past, I think that same character got married and then she had to leave him. So I guess she's just going through it. But like everything else is happening in this sort of consequenceless void of like, okay, you can do whatever you want in this universe, but as long as you stop the apocalypse and then do more time travel fuckery, none of this is gonna actually matter in the long term, none of these complex relationships, none of the activism these characters are doing, none of it has any lasting consequences because the only place you can have lasting consequences is in the character arcs and the world at large. And if the world keeps getting shifted out from under them <laughs> by time yeah, travel- that's like, that's speed running audience disinvestment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after they cha after the first season where they were like, oh, well, the entire world got destroyed anyway and now we're back in the 60s. I was like, all right, I'll watch for the 60s. I'm a little bit curious, but like I, the world is getting destroyed. <laughs> so I don't care. And then after they did it the second time, I was like, I'm good. Like, I, I know some people really like the show and I have nothing against a lot of the show. It's just very much not for me and this is specifically why. I just don't like it when a story gives me a big pile of fun things to get invested in and then punishes me for caring about 90% of them. And that's kind yeah. of the heart of the <laughs> multiverse problem. When you introduce a tool for the writer to use to decanonize whatever parts of their story they find inconvenient or they don't want to deal with or just any Thing that they want to 
sweep away, an audience that's been getting invested in that story is going to be hurt by this. Now, there are also a lot of big name wild cards of stories that have used the concept of a multiverse in a way that doesn't line up strictly with just being more Crisis on Infinite Earths and more problems, and I wanted to discuss some of them, starting with Spider-Man No Way Home, which of course yes. has, uh, <laughs> it's like a severely dumbed down version of the premise of Into the Spider-Verse, but it has the one advantage over Spider-Verse, which is the multiverses it's drawing its Spider-Man from are other movie franchises that actually exist. So rather than just being like, look, we have like a gritty noir Spider-Man and a, a pink Spider-Man. This is like, hey, you remember Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man? He's back. <laughs> you remember Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man? He's also back. So that's fun. The best parts of this movie are the parts of the movie that are not this movie. There are other movies. Unambiguously, yes. Unambiguously, <laughs> yes. The two alternate universes presented in this movie have their own movies attached. They are very beloved. I'd say more so than the movie they're being attached to. They explicitly matter. They aren't going to change and are respected by the movie, even though the premise of the movie is that they are trying to find a way to quote unquote cure the supervillains in the moments before they die. The implication of this is that this is going to change the timeline of the original movies, but this doesn't really bother the audience because no matter what they do, those original movies are still going to exist. Yeah. <laughs> like there's nothing that the MCU can do to decanonize the Sam Raimi movies being their own thing. There's also within the MCU, there's kind of the implication that timelines split when things change right. rather than being retconned or time loops, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, except for Doctor Strange, but that yeah, we'll, we'll get there, yeah. don't worry, the next slide. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> but within the internal logic, <laughs> put that in quotes, uh, of, of MCU time travel and multiversal-ness, the, the Raimi movies, the, the, the web movies, the Amazing Spider-Man are still, you know, their own little side sacred timelines. And yeah. I think the movie treats them with a lot more respect because they are separate films that are done rather than part of the MCU and therefore Lego toys to be broken open and reassembled at the whim of the director. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, of course, the entire point of Spider-Man No Way Home is to rework the MCU's Peter Parker into his more traditional form with a secret identity, no money, no Stark backing, no fancy suit, and no luck. This is what he probably should have been this whole time, but when you've given us four movies with this version of Peter, it's kind of a hard sell to be like, we're changing everything, actually, it's fine. Yeah. It's basically a soft <laughs> reboot of this Spider-Man justified in-universe with magic and multiverse breaking nonsense. Also, it's drawing on the infamously hated One More Day storyline where Peter sacrificed his marriage to Mary Jane and his future daughter Spider-Girl to save Aunt May's life. In this universe, in, in this movie, he sacrifices MJ and Ned's memory of him to save the world and then doesn't like tell them who he is afterwards. The thing is, this movie, by multiverse standards, is not bad. The way That's it handles fine. the multiverse is pretty <laughs> solid. Admittedly, the if you think about the logic of any of the spells involved in this movie, for any length of time, it stops making sense, but it's fun and it's fun because of the stuff it's drawing on from other movies. Essentially, rather than being a multiverse setting where none of the universes matter, this is a multiverse setting where some of the universes matter. It's a rare case where the universe that is the main universe for this movie is not strictly one of those multiverses that not. matters. <laughs> um, but the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man and the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man universes matter a lot and we want them to go back and be fine. Yeah. So. <laughs> and we also have a very interesting perspective if we are among the audience who've watched the previous movies because we have knowledge of the characters who come into this world, not just the other Spider-Mans, mm. but also the villains. And having a knowledge of how those characters works provides an interesting little bit of dramatic irony to whatever, you know, Peter, is is this Peter, Peter number three? Yeah, Peter, um, Peter two. Or is he Peter one? <laughs> I, it, it, whichever one, uh, Tom Holland. Uh, I think he's Peter one, right? He's got it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't he should have been it's, Peter it's, three, it, but you know how it is. Yeah, um, but it provides dramatic irony to what Tom Holland is trying to figure out and do, whereas we know like, oh, this Norman Green Goblin guy, he's he's shifty he's just because just he's acting nice now. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah. Yeah, and you know they so. knew that because if you're watching this not in a theater, the slightly awkwardly long pauses for cheers every time a character <laughs> shows up. This uh -huh. movie, All Things Considered, I had a great time with. I, I wasn't expecting to, oh, but yeah. I really did enjoy it. And it's entirely because the stuff from the other movies was handled in a very sweet kind of heartwarming way. The relationship between the three Spider-Men was very fun. And the way that it handled the multiverse specifically, very specifically cleared the problem of none of the universes matter and reached some of the universes matter. And that's why, even though they introduced a multiverse in it specifically for the purpose of retconning the main universe, it doesn't sting as badly. Also, I have a note here that you asked me to add for you to explain the difference between yes. meal and cake. <laughs> yes, so I think this movie is a great example of narrative storytelling cake. Mm. 
If the only point of this movie was to retcon trust fund Peter Parker into being scrappy little nobody, and it was just a multiverse plot within the confines of the MCU, it would have been stupid as hell, because all of the MCU parts of this movie are Peter doesn't get into college, so he asks Doctor Strange to cast a spell that destroys everyone's memory, mm -hmm. and that only happens because Peter and Doctor Strange are morons in this movie, yeah. who would rather do world-shattering things things than ask a question to clarify yeah. for a second. And the the MCU internal parts of this movie are so weak and contrived and so dumb. But once we start getting these other characters in, the villains and then eventually the other Spider-Mans, it becomes so much more fun because we're seeing what happens when you put two Spider-Mans in a room? What happens when you put three Spider-Mans in a room? What happens when you call out Peter and all three of them turn their heads? You get those kinds of fun moments of like the stuff of, you know, early 2010s, like, Tumblr posts of, like, Avengers Coffee Shop <laughs> AUs. Like, that was the height of MCU fandom, was just us thinking what these characters would do if they were in a room together hanging out. Yep. And that is so much fun. And the conversations they have are fascinating, insightful, deeply funny. The kinds of conversations that resolve lingering character arcs from the earlier movies where Tobey Maguire, like, consoles Andrew Garfield into, like, no, you are an amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. Like, I need you to... <laughs> He's like, just hey, no, I needed that. Yeah. Like, that also works metatextually of like, hey, you know, people kind of shat on his movies when they came out, but like, there's a lot of heart in them, and like, Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man is still a really fun, good character. Yeah. That kind of stuff is narrative cake. It's empty calories in terms of storytelling, but it's it fun. has value and fun to us as an audience that makes it worth whatever nonsense, you know, we had to do to, to get to this point of, of making Doctor Strange a moron, making, you know, this this version of Peter a moron. Yeah. And because it's a narrative cake, we will kind of be like, all right, fine, you know, whatever. Let's just get to the fun part and we can enjoy the parts of this that are fun. And the multiverse is an opportunity to have these kinds of interactions as opposed to stories where the multiverse is treated as a plot device mm -hmm. and is the central mechanism of the story around which everything revolves. We'll get to that example in a minute, yeah. I think. Yeah, we will. But the difference between, you know, a meal and a cake is Spider-Man No Way Home is not a meal. The plot is nonsensical, mm. but it is so much fun. It's like eating cake. It's empty calories. The story is very thin on the ground, but it's still so satisfying and enjoyable because it's everything we wanted to see with, with putting these Spider-Mans together. And yeah. that's why it exists and what it does. The ancillary benefit of, okay, and we've also reset the continuity is like, okay, yeah, whatever. Rewinds to when the Peters were, yeah. were doing the science lab thing. <laughs> that's the difference between a, a meal and cake in, in a multiverse story is, are you trying to actually build a meal around the concept of a multiverse? It's not really going to work because you end up having to make a lot of weird compromises and you get very close to the nun zone. Mm. But if you're just using the multiverse as an excuse for narrative cake, it's a lot easier to justify that, which is also why Avengers Endgame was not as bad as it could have been, despite the various flaws with that movie. Yeah. The time travel bits were fun. Yeah. They were enjoyable. They only <laughs> used the time travel for fan service and memes and, you know, that yeah. is America's ass. Yeah. Like, I thought, it, my problems with that movie aside, it did not use the multiverse irresponsibly so much. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I noticed about No Way Home is that you could feel that it was made by somebody with endless love in their heart for both the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies and the Amazing Spider-Man movies. Because, yes. like, the little references, just the moments, letting the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man save the girl <laughs> and have yeah. a breakdown oh, afterwards. God. Tobey Maguire <laughs> stopping Green Goblin from getting impaled on his own glider, all these moments where these Spider-Men get to fix their own worst failings and mistakes that the audience would not really know about without having watched their movies. Like, I think they briefly mention Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man is like, you know, I, I lost uh, Gwen, she was my MJ, and we get Tobey Maguire being like, you know, Green Goblin, like, die, you know, I regret that. But if you didn't watch the movie, like, you don't know the details, you don't understand the full meaning of him, like, catching the glider and, like, wordlessly pleading. So I would say that No Way Home is a movie that brings in a multiverse and uses it responsibly. Responsibly, but 
it is not the only movie in the MCU to use a multiverse. Though it may oh, be boy. the one that uses it the most responsibly, introducing it in this way is still a harbinger of things to come. So let's talk about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> um, Quickly, I hope. <laughs> oh god, I wish. Uh, the multiverse setting that we get in Multiverse of Madness sort of tries to do both alternate universes and extremely distinct worlds at the same time because it's like, oh, there's a ton of universes with Doctor Strange, but also there's one universe made entirely of paint. I don't really know how that's supposed to work. Premise of the movie, America Chavez is a universe hopper with no control over her powers. She's been to 72 different universes at the time of the story beginning. Despite this exciting premise, only two universes really matter in the story and our heroes only visit three. This movie introduces extremely blatantly a plot device for future crisis style universe alterations. An incursion occurs when the boundary between two universes erodes and they collide, destroying one or both entirely. So that's how we're going to get the X-Men in the MCU. I hope you're all happy. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this movie contains the other multiverse problem, which is reduced stakes via multiple timelines. This is a setting where, generously speaking, only one universe matters, which is the main one, the, the, the sacred timeline, whatever. Because when universes that aren't the main one are visited, they aren't really treated like functional worlds in their own right. There are more punchlines, and the characters in them that have superpowers tend to go out like punks. Captain Marvel gets squished by a statue, and somehow that kills her. World-ending threats get unleashed casually. And alternate Stephen Strange just made a hobby out of projecting his mind into other universes and, and like effortlessly murdering their extremely powerful Doctor Stranges. And I think if that had happened to our Strange, there would have been actual riots. I essentially, <laughs> this is a case where the rules of this story are so blatantly served by the needs of the plot. Characters from the main timeline, they'll have plot armor, they'll be strong and sturdy, and it'll take a lot of work to knock them down. But characters from any other universe are much less important, go out a lot faster, a lot more like punks. The universes don't get as much buildup, they don't mean as much. And in this specific movie, that's basically when Wanda kills the entire Illuminati, which is like Mr. Fantastic and Captain Marvel and like Captain Carter. Like, I understand some of those guys getting killed pretty quickly by the universe warping witch, but like... I mean, that version of Reed Richards deserved it. He was a moron. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because people were so excited for that cameo, but uh, watching it, I was just kind of like, this guy does not seem like he wants to be here. <laughs> <laughs> He's got one expression this whole time. Black Bolt going out like a punk. Professor X getting in like one kind of little moment of like, oh, that's that's not good Professor X content. And then getting his neck snapped. It's just like, yeah. this wouldn't happen if this was the main universe. And there's nothing separating them except needs of the plot. So that's the other multiverse problem. But more blatantly, this movie introduces the concept of incursions very specifically just to set up future universe fuckery. It's incredibly blatant. Yeah. The after credit scene has Clea showing up and being like, Doctor Strange, your manipulations have caused an incursion. We're going to go fix it into the sequel. And it's like, all right, if this is how you get the X-Men into the MCU, and if you killed off Wanda specifically so you can get the X-Men version of Wanda instead, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> so that's what I'm calling right now for why they did that that way. So this movie, I didn't particularly enjoy. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? No, I, I did not like it either. The one part of this movie that I thought was kind of interesting was leaning on director Sam Raimi's mm -hmm. horror movie backgrounds to create Wanda Maximoff horror movie villain like monster mm. characters like she's in the water, she's in the walls, man. <laughs> I, I thought it was well done and she is a force of nature when she destroys Kamratage but she's just like turbo insane and it, it's complete yeah. character assassination for kind of a cool fight sequence but it wasn't worth it. No. <laughs> it just wasn't. So Sorry, many man. plot points of Multiverse of Badness are drawing on one WandaVision. So if you haven't watched WandaVision, a lot of this won't make sense. Like, where the hell did she get the Darkhold? What does that mean? Wait, when did she start calling herself the Scarlet Witch? What's going on? But if you have watched WandaVision, you're gonna hate this movie because of what they do to Wanda. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. This whole, like, oh, I needed to let go of my family so that I would stop hurting people and we could all move on. That's the lesson she learns in WandaVision. And the, like, a one sentence line of like, oh, Wanda, the Darkhold is corrupting you. And that could have easily been ADR'd in after test audiences were like, I watched WandaVision. Why is she completely different now? It's just... Yeah. Ooh, talk about the hand and of the author. also, it's like Doctor Strange got corrupted by the Darkhold, but he's... Fine? He's fine, I guess. He has a third he's eye fine. now that looks like they put it there in MS Paint. But other than that, you know, he's fine. <laughs> uh, I, I feel bad for the the animators working on the MCU movies, but yes. I um I, I think it's it's telling that in both in both this example 
and the previous one. The entire multiverse plot is predicated on one of the characters acting completely out of character. Mm -hmm. Doctor Strange has to be an idiot for the plot of No Way Home to happen. Wanda has to be a monster for the plot of Multiverse of Madness to happen. Yeah. And it's all this like specific backwards cartwheeling through narrative hoops to to make happen. It once again, it's it's almost like with the little text post at the beginning of, of Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> it shows the hand of the creators so blatantly. It's like, look at this cool multiverse thing, but also here's all the nonsense we have to get through to make it happen. Yeah. And Multiverse of Madness, I think, makes the mistake of thinking that the Illuminati as a team of characters is as interesting as the triple Spider-Man team up. Yeah. And it's not. No. <laughs> because all of the Illuminati are treated like complete cannon fodder and they're all, every single one of them, a moron. Yeah. <laughs> Which is unfortunate because I wanted to like these characters like Captain Carter. Yo, they're so cool. But like every single one of them is so stupid. They're all very dumb. It's like, ah. So I, I also don't like that they're like, yeah, Mordo is trying to kill me in our timeline because when we first watched Doctor Strange, I was like, oh, Mordo going on a, a sorcerer genocide? That's actually a really interesting concept. Yeah. And they just throw it out the window. It happened off screen. It's just such so a funny thing. Like, I, that was so obviously what they were going to do for Doctor Strange too. And then they were like, no, no, no. Yeah. We're just going to assume. Like, well, let's just yes and that. Everybody knows. Yeah, yeah. Mordo and the Mage Genocide. We've all seen it. Like, <laughs> none of it's just so funny in a very annoying yeah. way. Like, our Strange so, didn't even know that was happening yet. <laughs> I, I went in with, with pretty low expectations. I mean, Doctor Strange 1 is one of my favorite Marvel movies. Yeah. Like, period. But it really was jarring how many compromises and how many concessions they had to make to create a multiverse plot. And the only reason it needs to be a multiverse plot is because Wanda wants it to be. And the only reason Wanda wants it to be is because they had to write it that way so that we can get the X-Men in two movies down the line. Yeah. So it's it, it's unfortunate because it is just so transparent for such a nebulous goal in sort of like the meta narrative of oh we have to we have to work towards you know bringing the X-Men into this universe we have to set it up in this movie. It flattens Doctor Strange's character arc it flattens America's character arc into oh the power was inside you all along <laughs> you just had to like concentrate on it for four seconds or whatever. Yeah. It's 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 frustrating. Uh, it's frustrating because it was a kernel of an interesting idea that just got so strung out into narrative soup where the stakes are nothing and the characters barely grow or change, only overcoming character arcs that were imposed on them in this movie. Yeah. Where it's like Doctor Strange is st still hung up on, on Christine, which didn't get any of that for, you know, like the last six years of Marvel cinema, despite the fact that he's been in like six movies. Mm. And Wanda has to unlearn her lessons so she can relearn her lesson. It's so weak. It's frustrating. Yeah. It, it is unfortunate. But the effects were decent. Yeah, it looked really good. It, it did it, look really in good. In places, anyway. Yeah, but uh, the other cool thing about timeline resets is that they're not actually always bad, because if you're careful, they can work really well. And my go-to example for this is X-Men Days of Future Past, which I don't remember if you've seen or not. I have not. Okay, so basically, after the events of the first several X-Men movies, which are all, you know, kind of in, in one timeline, yeah, they haven't really introduced that much weirdness, they did a movie called X-Men First Class, which was essentially a prequel where it's like back in the 70s and it's like oh it's young Charles Xavier it's young Eric Lencher they're becoming besties and and uh, they're also other characters are there but really they're not important or well written so it doesn't really matter and then in Days of Future Past basically the version of Wolverine from the first three movies but like 50 years in the future gets his consciousness sent back in time to the timeline of First Class like just the past the prequel to try and prevent the extremely bad apocalyptic future they're living in now there are a few things that make this feel not terrible. The reset begins in the extremely far terrible future, but not the established and familiar present setting. So it's like, we're not starting from, oh no, I'm really invested in this setting happening. I don't want it to get messed up. We're starting in, you know, the universe is a blasted purple colored hellscape. We probably don't actually want to end up here. The reset timeline takes place in the past with a new cast rather than essentially being reset in place. So it's not like a flashpoint situation.
situation where the main character is back in their familiar timeline except everything is wrong. It's more like you're back in the 70s, let's do things a little bit differently now. The things that they mostly reset were writing decisions that nobody liked because at the end of Days of Future Past, Wolverine wakes up in the present or like the future, but everything is good now. Like all the characters that died in X3 are alive again. Everyone's hanging out. It's just kind of implied that things are nice and the status quo is where it's supposed to be. And most people don't really mind that those got changed. And I think possibly most crucially, they didn't do it more than once and there's no way for them to do it again. <laughs> because the way the timeline reset works is that in the distant future, Kitty Pride's mutant power allows her to send someone's consciousness back in time. But it's not like she can still do that in the timeline that Wolverine wakes up in at the very end of the movie. And then they don't do any more movies in that timeline. They just did more movies in the past timeline, which they probably shouldn't have done. But like in general, Days of Future Past is probably the X-Men movie that is the best, that, that people like the most with the least reservations. And it's just because the way it handled it managed to sort of dodge every single landmine in the multiverse timeline reset writing game. All the things that they could do wrong, establishing a precedent by which they can just reset whenever they want. Well, they didn't do that. And the fact that they didn't do that basically saved them from almost every other bad thing that can happen with a timeline reset plot. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, I, I, might, I might actually watch that one at some point. I think I've gone on record as saying the only X-Men movies I've seen are Wolverine, The Wolverine. Oh no. The Deadpool movies, which do slap. Yeah. And the first half of X3, which we watched at a movie night with some of our friends together. Oh, God. Uh, before going to college. I um, think that's possibly the worst experience you could have had, <laughs> except for the Deadpool yeah. movies. Yeah. God, yes. No, no sure, Days of sure. Future Past is actually good. <laughs> you should indeed Oh, I've seen it. Logan. Logan was good. Oh, yeah. Logan was good. Logan was very depressing, though. I wouldn't call it representative. Yeah, so I wanted to also highlight just a truly spectacular movie that involves a multiverse, because it came out the same weekend is Multiverse of Madness, and everyone who saw them were like, if you only pick one multiverse-themed movie to watch this weekend, don't watch Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of our friend's brothers described it as, if you are curious about everything everywhere all at once, and Multiverse of Madness, and you want to watch them both, watch everything everywhere all at once twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes, so, uh, everything everywhere all at once. I have a, just a quickie summary over the next couple slides, because you mentioned you hadn't seen it, and I didn't want to assign not. you more homework. I, I have not been doing much film going this year. <laughs> good. So, <clears throat> the main character of Everything Ever All at Once, Evelyn Wang, she's not having a good time. The laundromat being audited by the IRS. Her happy-go-lucky husband, Waymond, is not intending to divorce her, but he is serving her divorce papers as basically a wake-up call to make her confront some problems that have been going on. Her formerly abusive and now very ill father has just shown up from Hong Kong, and she's very worried about not impressing him. And her daughter, Joy, is dating a white girl. <laughs> what else could go wrong? <laughs> Everything Everywhere All at Once, obviously. While they are at the IRS getting audited, Waymond abruptly shifts and becomes a Jackie Chan style fighting badass, tells Evelyn that she's the only one who can save them from a multiverse spanning threat, which is basically the, the monstrous version of their near omniscient, near omnipotent daughter who splintered her consciousness across the multiverse and now wants to destroy everything. This happened by a technology that Evelyn herself invented in this other universe, where instead of running a failing laundromat and kind of having nothing going on in her life, she's a brilliant scientist who found a way that you could tap into the minds of your alternate lives down different choices you could have taken. And our Evelyn is the only one who can save the world because she has missed every single opportunity in her life. <laughs> she's accomplished nothing. So she's uniquely qualified to reach out to those many alternate versions of herself that are just one different choice away. And she can gain all their various skills and abilities to defeat the monster that her daughter has become. And she ends up so sort insulting. of- insulting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. No, yeah. <laughs> but as Evelyn decides to, you know, try this to confront her daughter or to save her daughter, she's not entirely sure what's going on. She splinters her mind across increasingly bizarre universes, gains power, struggles to understand her daughter, who she basically pretty quickly concludes isn't evil. She's just experiencing the mother of all existential crises, you know? If you splinter your consciousness across every single universe where every choice you've ever made has happened, it's kind of very easy to feel like nothing matters. And Evelyn sort of succumbs to the same worldview, because she's already not in a great place, and basically she also kind of concludes, you know what, everything sucks, nothing matters. But her worldview is shifted by her husband, Waymond, who has a, who's all movie displayed played a relentlessly hopeful attitude, just very cheerful, very sweet. He's got this cute habit of putting little googly eyes on everything, and uh, there's visual symbolism where the uh, the symbol of nihilism and self-destruction is an everything bagel, which is a black hole with a white hole.
hole in the middle, and then uh, the symbol for happiness and hope and positive nihilism is the googly eye, which is the white hole with the black in the middle. You yeah, get it. It's, it's Yeah, it's very clever. And basically, in one of the alternate universes that Evelyn is currently experiencing, where she is basically the real Michelle Yeoh, has, a, has had a very prolific uh, career as a, an actress and stunt woman and stuff like that, she's reconnected with the Waymond in that universe, who she never married. He went off and kind of became a successful businessman, and they're reconnecting. And he tells her that his positivity, you know, it's not naivete, it's it's a strategic, necessary choice. He's choosing to focus on the good. I, I think one of his lines is like, you know, you tell me the world is cruel. I know that. I've lived on this world as many days as you. Highlighting, like, I'm not happy and positive because I'm stupid. I'm happy and positive because I need to be to survive. And essentially this worldview, highlighting the goodness and beauty present in every single one of these universes that she's now part of, sort of flips her worldview on her head. It's like, okay, well, if nothing matters, everything matters. And, and kindness and joy and being able to better the lives of all these people whose lives I can now touch, that's something that's very important. And there's a pretty spectacular fight scene where she essentially <laughs> works her way through a crowd of evil minions by like reaching out to the different universes where she knows what their problems are and then solving them <laughs> in this one and just gets through it through the power of kindness and punching. And at the end of the movie, she pulls her daughter out of this like sucking tar pit of nihilism by essentially affirming that like, yes, there are infinite universes out there, but I will always choose to be here with you. And the open-hearted love and kindness that her mother finally shows her pulls Joy out of her nihilistic death spiral and saves the day. And thanks to the power of love, everything is good again. So this movie's really good and everybody should watch it. <laughs> um, but yeah. specifically, no, the way that it handles the multiverse <laughs> is essentially it puts the central question that provokes the multiverse problem on screen. If there are infinite universes where anything and everything can happen, that means our main original universe doesn't matter. It could be destroyed without it mattering because nothing matters. Isn't that, isn't that what this means? And the movie says, no. <laughs> the movie says if nothing matters, everything matters equally. And you can choose to focus on the parts of it that do matter to you. And like, oh, even if there's a universe where this thing didn't happen, it matters that in this universe it did happen. And the reason why this movie completely avoids the multiverse problem, it basically has the characters be like, yes, it is possible, like we could wreck this universe, but we're not going to. We're going to choose to focus on what's happening here and what matters and, and what's important. We're gonna stay together and we're gonna focus on kindness and love and enjoying what we have in our lives rather than focusing on what ifs and trying to burn the world down because it doesn't fit our, our standards. So it's a rare multiverse story that works because it purposefully confronts the crux of the multiverse problem and politely but firmly acknowledges it for what it is. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Of course yeah. the universe matters. And that's why this is the superior multiverse movie that everybody should watch before they try writing a multiverse story. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think so. There's there's a lot to unpack and mm. I, I, I see ample opportunity for a separate detail <laughs> dive drive on everything ever all at once. This is like but, a tenth um, of what's happening in that movie. <laughs> no, I, I, I know. Uh, I'm sure many other uh, film channels have, have gotten to it first. Probably, um, yeah. But it, it is, I mean, from me knowing only what you just told me right now, um, <laughs> It is very cool that they do take that angle of it's not like there's a sacred timeline because the idea that, oh, yes, yes, Doctor Strange, yes, uh, Bruce Banner, Hulk, this is mm -hmm. the sacred timeline. <laughs> this is, is the like, way it was always says, meant to be. says, says fucking who? Mm -hmm. Who says this is sacred? Kevin Feige? Is, <laughs> does he exist in universes like, nope, nope, this is the one. It's, it, it, it's this one. Sorry, guys. It's, it's not that this one matters because it has more comic books about it or we've had, you know, however many more films in it so far. Things matter because people exist in them mm -hmm. and people having thoughts and feelings create meaning from anything and nothing, yeah. which is how much larger conversation me, an agnostic, still feels like the universe does matter mm -hmm. because there are people in it with thoughts and feelings who deserve happiness and that is how we create meaning in a universe without having it prescribed for us by whatever... Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah um, something. It's it's a very clever way to philosophically confront the problem, not with like world building technicalities and like specific um actuallys of how the multiverse works because Superman did a thing in this one place and punched this guy and, and did whatever. <laughs> it's it confronts the multiverse problem not with a hierarchy of narrative importance.
importance, but with a very centralized, person-specific perspective. It's not like this universe is more important because this is where the camera is hanging out and looking mm -hmm. around. It's that every single one of these universes is equally important because there are people in them. We just happen to be looking at this one, yeah. and we can see for ourselves why this universe is important, but that is not an assessment that it is more important than any of the other ones. Right, yeah. And all of us live very small slices of the human experience at a time, yet our lives are still full of tremendous amounts of meaning, not because we're the protagonist <laughs> of Earth, none of us are, none of us will be, no. but because we are the protagonists of ourselves, exactly. and that is what meaning derives from, that we have to assign and categorize and figure out for ourselves individually and as communities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it matters because we live it, and that's, you know, looking at yourself as the hero of your own story is, uh, it can be dangerous if you expand that to be the hero of every story, but sometimes it's very important to sort of sit in yourself and be like, I am an instrument through which the universe can care about itself, and then just sort of go from there. So this movie is really good, and uh, everybody should watch it. I think genuinely yeah. the world would be a better place if everybody did. And one thing that I thought was cool about this world specifically is that during the sort of montage of Evelyn changing her worldview and getting better, we actually see her in all of those universes where she did like something self-destructive and messed it up, going to like fix it in every single universe, even the ones that are like joke universes where they have hot dog fingers or like she's working as like one of those really fancy chefs and her coworker is being ratatouille by a raccoon. She still helps him get the raccoon back. So it's like even in the silly universes, it still all matters. Yeah. And it's there's an ambiguity at the end of the movie of which universe we're in. We, we spent most of the story in a, the universe where she was fighting everybody, but it's not entirely clear. But also it doesn't matter because they all matter. This is the sneaky example of the only case I've ever found of a story where every single universe matters. It, it's, it's the all universes matter of multiverse movies. Uh, definitely watch it. Anyway, uh, so this, this example of a movie that categorically avoids the multiverse problem kind of helps highlight the dimensions of this problem and helps us sort of demarcate what exactly is up with it, why it happens, and maybe how it can be avoided. A multiverse does not automatically destroy audience investment. It does not have to do that. But it is an extremely convenient shortcut if the writer wants an in-universe mechanism for retcons. If it's not used that way, you frequently don't get the multiverse problem. If it is used that way, bad sign. If you do this, a previously linear story suddenly becomes a multiverse, and it's usually a sign that the writer is contriving a way out of a corner they've written themselves into, or into changing something fundamental they can't change in another way. Not everything in a story matters to the same degree, but drawing attention to this fact reminds the audience that this is a story, which kind of harkens back to that point you were making about, you know, making the audience aware of the hand of the author, making them very aware that a writer is making decisions for them about what parts of the story they can find interesting. Doing that breaks the audience's trust in the narrative, and that is the multiverse problem. Ta-da! Ta-da! Yeah. So in conclusion, you'd think that they'd stop breaking the DC universe because like, we keep hitting the button to break everything and it hasn't fixed everything yet. <laughs> I know, You need to guys. build a fix-it button, guys. Yeah. Well, the problem... <laughs> it's a different button. The problem is people have tried to fix it, and then a few years later, someone's like, ah, it's crazy, and then they hit the break everything button again because they have the button installed. <laughs> it's scary to work on a project as big and complicated, specifically in the example of, of comics, mm. and the reflex is, oh, this would just be easier if I broke it down, if I, I streamlined it and simplified it and condensed it down to this, this one timeline, this one whatever. Yep. It is hard to do complicated art like that. It's hard. It's very hard to write good comic books. That's why there aren't a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> This is why my favorite but... way of dealing with this is in the form of like cartoon adaptations and, and movie adaptations. Sp some, some movie adaptations. <laughs> um, because that way the writer of that can pick and choose the parts of the story that they think work best and work them into an adaptation without automatically having to be completely in service to the one established sacred timeline canon that this is drawn from. I recently reread a whole bunch of the New Teen Titans and I, the whole time I was like, oh, they turned this into like an episode of the cartoon, but they changed it a lot to make it work with the tone they set. And honestly, I don't hate that very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you get a couple seasons of a cartoon adaptation of a series you like, and then you're like, I have this. I don't need to worry about anything else now. You know, we'll always have yeah. Earth's Mightiest Heroes. <laughs> we'll always have Spectacular Spider-Man. We'll always have Spectacular Spider-Man. Anyway, I that's... That. It's on Disney Plus now. Oh, really? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's basically me out of slides, but... Yeah, I uh, I think maybe that... I, I don't know if I, this is a fully thought
thought out thought or if this is too controversial of a statement, but I feel like given everything that we've said so far in this however many in a minute presentation, this is this might be a, a record for minutes and, and uh, detail well, I'm going to try and cut it um, down. <laughs> no, no, this is good. This is good. Oh, um, I think the multiverse problem is only a problem if you let it be. Mm. If you are insecure enough in the story that you are telling that you feel like this is the only way out, you have already lost. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> if your first reflex is hit the break it button, multiverse time, look, it'll be fun. That's that's one you've 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 boofed it and you're you're pretty much out because doing interesting stuff like Dick Grayson doing a whole like detective thing to figure out what's up with Power Girl or Wonder, Wonder Girl, Girl or whatever <laughs> almost which one's the boob window yeah that's a, that's um, Power Girl yeah like that is interesting and you can take lapses in continuity and use that as a way to create more story mm -hmm. it's like what's the deal with all these Robins <laughs> it's like they're they're all they can all be a part of the thing mm -hmm. <laughs> you you can have more story and that can work. You can have Elseworlds and that can work, but the multiverse problem only rears its ugly head when you have to find a way to justify bringing the X-Men in 27 movies into a franchise. <laughs> and only then have you fucked yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is part of why, like, the start, the impetus behind this video is because I noticed that I was complaining to everybody I knew <laughs> about any story I liked starting to make multiverse noises. Because I was like, yeah. why would I, why do I automatically, why am I so suspicious of this? But I realized, like, no, this is a finely honed instinct. This is from our days surviving on the savannah. I know whereof <laughs> I speak. I can see what's on the horizon. Because once you introduce, there's a multiverse, are you? universe is but one of many. It doesn't need to be you. You might handle it perfectly. The next writer might handle it perfectly, but the writer after that has a tool that you gave them, perfectly designed to yeah. change everything from the ground up. It's like when people are like, oh, you know, a benevolent tyranny is the perfect way to run a government. It's like, <laughs> yeah, sure, you might run it perfectly. Your kid might even run it perfectly, but your grandkid is probably going to be a spoiled despot. <laughs> it needs, it, yeah. it can't just work for you. It needs to work for everybody who follows after you. And when you introduce a multiverse, the possibilities for abuse are just horrifyingly powerful. So that's yeah. the multiverse problem. And that's why anytime a large franchise I follow starts making multiverse noises, I'm like, all right, I give you what, four or five more installments before this crashes and burns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. I, I don't know what on earth is going to happen with the MCU long term, medium term. <laughs> I think we've spelled out our expectations pretty clearly. <laughs> There's no way to put it back in the bag. No, no. There's no way to put it back in the bag. No matter what they do, you, you can put the Infinity Stones back in the back because those are rocks. Yeah. You can get, you can put those back in their universes and, and tuck them away outside of the sacred timeline. But once you crack open multiverses, there is nothing you can do to take that, that Chekhov's railgun out of, <laughs> out of range of the, the proverbial stage. Yeah. It's, it is irrevocable. Well, irrevocable. Irrevocable, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, irrevocable. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm not making any, yeah. well, I suppose I am making a lot of judgments. A lot of extremely judgmental <laughs> statements came out in the last nearly two hours, but I just wanted to collate all my thoughts on the nature of multiverses in fiction and, and what they do, and specifically the poor, poor state of the DC universe. Yeah. It's like it, it didn't have to go down this road. Perhaps there's a universe out there where DC <laughs> Comics was like, no, no, red stop, no, <laughs> no, let's not do crisis. It is a silly place. But yeah, I think that's about our bases covered. So, uh, uh, bye. bye. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!